So let's do the the edge case, if you will. So what if there's an open loop pole on the contour gamma n? The magnitude of the contour gh becomes infinite. But we cannot determine at which phase it does so. Okay? So we know the magnitude is going to become infinite because we're going to divide by 0, right? So it's going to approach infinity. But if you do that, if you look at the phase uh, formula, you can't compute what the phase is going to be. So that's an issue. Um, in these cases, we take an infinitesimal detour around the pole so that we can keep track of the phase. Okay. Um, whether or not this is strictly kosher, I don't know. But this is what everyone does, uh, and it works oh, to figure out the phase. <laughs> right. We'll just go around it in a very, very small radius. How small? However small you think, but smaller. Um, um, OK, so the, uh, the magnitude still approaches infinity, but the phase information is retained. Let's consider another example that illustrates this. All right. So in this one, we have an open loop transfer function defined by this. So we have one zero this time and two poles. Those two poles are at plus or minus j, right? J1. Sketch, so they're on the, on the imaginary axis, so therefore they are, are uh, uh, Nyquist contour goes right through them. So sketch the Nyquist plot and apply the Nyquist criterion to determine the number of closed loop holes in the right half plane. This is what a lot of the homework problems are going to be like. It's like, here's a transfer function, sketch the Nyquist plot, determine the number of poles in the right half plane. Comment on stability, that type of thing. So, all right. Let's do essentially the same thing as before, where we'll draw our, our axes, our real and imaginary axes. And um, we'll put our poles and our zeros on first. So our zero is just at minus one, right? And then our pole, uh, our first pole is here. Our other pole is there. And we're going to draw the contour, but we're going to draw it with these infinitesimal detours. So we get up to the pole, and super close to the pole, we go on a little detour around it, and then we continue on up to infinity, and then we go around and around and around and around to here, this way, and our negative imaginary axis we go up and we jut out notice that we jut out into the right half plane we got to make sure we do it in the right direction if we did went the other way we would be containing it inside um, and we don't wish to do that so this is our new contour that we're going to map. Is that goes out to infinity both directions? Yeah. So this is infinity minus infinity plus infinity. You know, I just wasn't labeling anything. Butterfly. Okay. So uh, we're going to do exactly the same thing we did before. We're going to pick um, some different points and go around and look at the magnitude and the phase. So the magnitude the 
magnitude of, I'll just write it GH of gamma N is equal to 10, a scaling factor is always in there, 10 times whatever the length is of the vector that goes from the zero to, we're just going to pick an arbitrary point out here. I'll just draw it to there. I'll use gray. Um, and we're also going to have contributions from all of these. So I'll call, um, I'll call this one L1. I'll call this one L2. I'll call this one L3. So our, our uh, uh, magnitude is going to be 10 times L1 divided by L2 times L3, right? Easy enough. And our phase is going to be that it's going to be equal to if we stuck in some little phase arrows here this is going to be theta 3 theta 1 1 and theta 2 is hard to see so I'm not going to muck up our stuff so it's going to be theta 1 minus what Yep. So there's one more thing to keep track of in this one because we have a zero and it's a different sign and so it's in the numerator of the magnitude. But it's the same problem that we did before. Um, so when we start off at, so I'm going to draw New axis here, real, imaginary. And we start off here at the origin, and our, our magnitude at that point, this is at minus 1. These are at uh, plus and minus 1, right? Uh, Cool. I screw up literally ten times I try to say one thing, pretty much. It's especially late in the day. So we have ourselves at this at this origin, all the magnitudes are one, right? Um, that's convenient. And so it's ten times one divided by one times one which is a convenient number we like to call 10. Um, so we start off at 10, and I'm going to use orange. So we start off at 10, and this is our, our A prime, right? A prime. Start off at 10. And we're going to march up here. Um, things are going to be pretty uniform until we hit this. And what's actually happening is our, our uh, <coughs> one of our poles is getting larger. The other uh, pole vector is getting smaller. The zero is getting a little bit larger. Um, and so it does actually, the magnitude grows a little bit. The phase is, the phase contributions of the pole and the zero or, or, sorry, of the two poles on the imaginary axis, one of them is going to be plus 90, the other one's going to be minus 90, right? And so they cancel each other out. So the only phase has to do with theta 1. Theta 1 is going to go from 0 to 45 degrees, right? It's going to start off at 0, and then when it gets to 1, it'll be at 45 degrees. So something like this happens, right? I mean, maybe not quite that drastic, but magnitude grows a little bit and we go up to 45 degrees 
It's about 45. And then we have this little sidestep here. And what that does is it, it doesn't really contribute to much. Um, but, oh. When I said that this, you know, maybe not that drastic, it is definitely that drastic, right? It goes out, how large is this magnitude going to get as we approach this pole? We're going to divide by this pole length, which gets L3, L2, gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller as we get closer here. So this is going to go off to infinity, right? This is going to go off to infinity in radius. The phase will go to 45 degrees. And then we hit here, and the phase is going to, it, the magnitude is going to stay the same, right? Because we're going to go, we're going to be arbitrarily close to that pole. So the magnitude still stays at infinity, but the phase is going to have a shift. The shift, the, the contribution from this pole was 90 degrees, this pole was negative 90 degrees. Now they're both going to be 90 degrees, right? So we're going to have a shift of 180 degrees that happens all at magnitude infinity. <laughs> Something like that. The phase angle from the zero isn't doing anything as we go around this curve. Um, uh, I didn't mean to curve that at the end. There we go. So it goes all over here. It's still at magnitude infinity. And then we're going to come back down to something reasonable in magnitude as we get away from that. Um, and the phase is going to approach what? It's going to be um, positive 90 from theta 1 and then negative 90, negative 90, right? So it's got to approach <coughs> negative 90. So it's positive 90, minus 90, minus 90 gives you negative 90. So it's got to approach this negative imaginary axis, and the magnitude is going to go to 0, right? It's got to go to 0 because L2 and L3 and uh, uh, L1 are, so L2 and L3 are going to be approaching infinity. L1 is going to be approaching infinity, but L2 uh, uh, and 3 are going to dominate because they're both contributing. In the denominator. You could, once again, mathematically, we probably should go through the details of that, but we're not going to. So we, we're going to go approach the origin, and the phase is going to approach negative 90 degrees. All right, so that was the positive axis. Now it's going to go, we're going to go around the big green loop. And we're going to be staying at the origin around this big green loop, um, and the because we're always going to have this magnitude being uh, zero, but we're, our phase is going to change. So the phase is going to change from negative 90, and then we're going to go down here, and this one's going to contribute negative 90. These will start contributing positive 90 each. So we're going to go to positive 90 degrees. So it's going to go around to positive 90 degrees. It'll go around that way. And so we go from negative 90, we come out at positive 90, and then the, uh, the blue one is, we could go through the whole argument again, but as we discovered before, it's just going to be symmetric, right? So this is going to be symmetry. So I have no problem just trusting our conclusion that this is symmetric. 
and drawing it like this and and watch me totally not nail this this one's really hard for me I have a hard time with that one yeah it's not bad right just give it some eyes and some teeth yeah Ah, oh, it needs to be made up of a finite number of smooth curves. But when they join, they don't have to be able to be differenti differentiated. Oh. Differentiable. Okay. Yeah. So they, they just have to be, it has to be composed of a bunch of segments that are. Yeah. Um, good. So. Let's take a look. Um, unfortunately, this example, although it does show you this exception, it doesn't show you much interesting in terms of the stability because um, minus one is back here, right? And we don't have any encirclements of it. It does come flirt with minus one, but it never goes around minus one. And we had no unstable poles to start, we had we had a, a two that were marginally stable, and so we didn't have any. So p was equal to zero. Encirclements was zero, and therefore zero minus zero equals zero, and we have stability of the closed loop. What do you mean? Because you know how those two poles right there on, on the imaginary? It's going gonna, it's gonna to circle towards the zero. Mm -hmm. And if you want to towards it, want to out. And then that, that picture is almost like looking at that, that little Pac Man. Mm -hmm. It looks like almost the exact same thing, but the exact opposite of it. Like, yeah, I mean, mathematically, it's. It, I don't think there's a direct relationship there. So if you draw like a root locus, it'll complete that circle. I don't know, right? It just looks like the exact opposite. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, so. It is weird that they're so related. I mean, they are related, but it's not in a, a direct way that I have an understanding of. Um, they're related in the sense that they both have things to say about the stability of the closed loop system. And so they're, they're really connected through that, but it, the form of them, they're very different. And the way we interpret them is very different too. Um, because this is not, uh, the, the Nyquist plot is not directly saying anything about where the closed loop poles are. You have to interpret it from encirclements of a contour that you map through it. Um, yeah. Huh. I'll have to think about that more. Okay. Uh, very good. So the rest of this was just. I wrote a lot of those. I'm still trying to figure out the best way to do this because when you try to describe this in words, like I did when I wrote up my notes on this, is like it's like two pages worth of discussion of it. But we just talk through it. But then you guys don't have that record of the talking through it besides the video. So you just have your minds, your understanding, the logos. Does that sound familiar to anyone this yeah. from a philosophy class? Yeah. Yay! That's why you take philosophy. To get references from me. I think I've got the logos. But... Yeah, well, I've heard both. So, yeah, there was a school that was near where I grew up called Logos. And then the philosophy teacher that I took, he called it Logos. And then I was like, I don't know. I'll go with the second one. Just Is that the same guy who told you to say Tao like talk? No. <laughs> <laughs>
That is, uh, that wasn't even an engineering professor that I had. Actually, that wasn't even, that was no professor that I had. I think that I picked that up when I went to the, the uh, Tabitha Pi convention. So that's like the other engineering honor society. So there's two of them. There's five, what was the one we have? Tau Sigma. Pi Tau Sigma. And then there's Tau Beta Pi. And so I was part of that when, when I was in school. And so I went to the conference and stuff. And so everybody there called it Tau Beta Pi. And I, like, I was like, oh, I didn't even know that was how you could pronounce it. And then it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I was telling my students, like, I think the pronunciation is Ta. And they were like, uh, no, it's Tau. And we looked it up, and it's both. So <laughs> we're both right. Um, yeah. Okay. So that concludes our our notes on the Nyquist uh, criterion.